Hello, I'm Michelle Tapper with the latest from science. Australia has a long history of bushfires, but this summer they were unprecedented anywhere in the world. Months of severe drought and record-breaking temperatures fueled a series of blazes that ripped through our nation. So what effect did climate change have on our country's biggest ever natural disaster? Well, joining us today is Dr. Michael Sean Fletcher from the University of Melbourne, who specialises in climatology, ecosystems, geography and landscapes. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Thanks, Michelle. Nice to be here. Now, 2019 was the hottest and driest year ever in Australia. In fact, it was the first time that both records were broken together. What effect did climate change have on the bushfires? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, there's been a lot of debate in the media about the role of climate change. What climate change does is it changes the long-term average and we've seen a steady increase in temperatures, which makes extreme events like the drought that uh, we experience on the eastern seaboard of Australia even more extreme. So it exacerbates those impacts. So as climate changes, we continue to see this, what we call a press of climate change. Um, and over the top of that, the pulse disturbances like droughts and, and other events become more extreme as the, as the climate changes and that baseline shifts. So the current fires that we experience were the product of a long, prolonged drought, um, the long press of increasing temperatures, making that drought worse, and a combination of uh, extremely high fuel loads over a really, really broad area of Australia. Yes, absolutely. So in addition to the really hot and dry temperatures, like you said, there, there was that large fuel load. And there was also a lot of uh, finger pointing and blame from people saying that not enough hazard reduction burns were carried out. What does the scientific evidence show? Hazard reduction burns aim to protect assets that we value. They might be life, property or other areas. And they're generally, considering the, the magnitude of these fires, they're pretty small scale and they only impact uh, a smaller part of the, the broad area that was uh, that is flammable in Australia. So they're really effective at mitigating against fires. But when you get extreme fires like we've experienced uh, in the Black Summer fires and, and previous fires, uh, catastrophic bushfires that have hit the southeast of Australia, they're really a no barrier at all. Once these fires get hot enough, and they're into the canopy of trees and they're spotting for kilometres, no amount of hazard reduction burning, which is small scale really, uh, is able to impact the, the spread of these fires. So once these fires are going, once you have that huge fuel load, the right weather conditions, the long-term drying, the, the warming of the climate, uh, once these fires get going, the sort of, sort of small breaks relative to the size of these fires that we put in with hazard reduction burnings are really ineffective. That's pretty much what happened this past summer. And by February this year, more than 17 million hectares had been burned. Now that's twice as much as the Amazon wildfires of 2019. What impact has this had on our wildlife and biodiversity? Yeah, it's, it, these fires are unprecedented. In the geological record, going back you know, tens of years to tens of millions of years, there's no precedent for the magnitude of these fires that we saw in terms of their size. Um, and that has a really, really huge impact on, on wildlife and biodiversity. Australia has, you know, six to 700,000 different species uh, in the plants and mammals. Uh, around 85% of those are endemic. That means they're found nowhere else on Earth. So it's a really precious resource. It's a, it's a nationally, uh, sorry, an internationally important resource of biodiversity, which has uh, infl implications for economic uh, purposes, cultural, people, um, the aesthetic value that people have, the intrinsic value of these things. Uh, ecologically, there's a lot of ecosystem services that provide clean water, clean air, all these um, functions that ecosystems perform uh, by these unique set of species for this unique kind of landscape. Normally, fires occur, we do have fires, and there's been fires all throughout geological history in Australia um, that has changed under various types of climate. Once uh, people arrived 65,000 years ago, they changed yet again. So there's always been fire of some sort. It's the type of fire that varies. And these latest ones are huge. And they treated all that area with one particular treatment, if you like, a really hot burn over large areas. And biodiversity really depends on uh, heterogeneity, okay, areas that, that do burn, don't burn, animals and plants and other things can 
can move into those areas, you get survival, you get different stages of recovery, and that promotes diversity across the landscape. These fires are different. All of the area was burned at once. All of those animals and plants and other things were impacted at once. Uh, and really the, the washout from that is we don't know the true impact. We're starting to get a measure on those sorts of things. But that, that kind of uh, treatment of a landscape with really hot fires is unprecedented and has catastrophic effects for biodiversity. It's estimated that more than a billion animals were killed during the fires. Um, can our wildlife ever recover from such a hit or do you think we'll see some species near extinction? Oh, there's definitely species that are being pushed to the brink. Uh, I think the estimates are between uh, 20 and 100 different species are, are, that were previously endangered are, are being pushed to the brink of extinction. Uh, that's because of not only the direct impacts of fire and killing individuals, but the removal of habitat, hollow logs, um, healthy soils, all of those sorts of things that were impacted. And they're, they're often impacted in, in big fires. It's not no, no difference this time. The difference is the amount of area that was impacted by the, the bushfires, not providing that diversity in the landscape where, where life can continue and organisms can um, recover. So there are a number of species, 20 to 100, that are potentially impacted. I think my personal opinion is they will recover, but the problem is how often will these things happen in the future? How much more can they withstand? Will another one be enough to knock a whole bunch of them out? We see this in the geological record that repeated disturbances, big disturbances, whatever they are, and meteor impacts, all these sorts of things, can have really big negative impacts on biodiversity and species extinction. Uh, it depends on how often they occur and where they occur and all those sorts of things. But right now, there will probably be a recovery through time of, of a number of these species. But the question is what happens if and when another one of these occurs? Yeah, an absolutely devastating impact on our wildlife. And of course, the one animal that captured the hearts of the nation was the koala. We saw just heartbreaking images of thousands of them being destroyed. How is the koala recovery process going? I think um, initially there was a, a concerted effort to, to identify areas of land that were not impacted or less impacted to provide uh, reserves and, and recovery areas for koalas. And the recent pandemic has taken the wind out of the sails in that a little bit. Um, I think there's no doubt that the koala um, species and the, and the vari variation across its range has been really heavily impacted by these fires. Uh, recovery, like uh, I just said before, will, will likely occur uh, quite slowly if we can get those protected areas um, and if we can manage them and assist the koalas to, for recovery. And that, as I said, that there was a commitment by various state governments to, to allocate those reserves. Obviously, with the current scenario we're in, the, the amount of effort that can go into that uh, has been impacted. Um, but prior, in February, prior to, to the COVID impact, um, recovery was, was being planned for and assistance was, was there. So I think there's a good chance that koalas will survive. Um, but once again, it depends on how often these occur in the future. Is there any way to prevent these mega bushfires from happening again or will it become the new norm as climate change increases? Both. We have to understand that we're gonna get these bushfires uh, on occasion, but we can definitely do a lot more by looking outside the traditional box that we're in uh, to manage and mitigate how often, and when they do occur, how big they are. So I think that the answer is both. I think the key is the return of cultural burning to, to the forested estate. I think that we need to seriously consider what we can learn and what we can do in terms of keeping landscape scale fuel loads low, not just around areas of interest, but right through the forest estate. One thing we know about uh, indigenous fire practices, cultural burning, indigenous land management, is that it's uh, holistic. It, it spreads across a landscape rather than just around particular assets and values. It's a method of land management that has um, spiritual, cultural and pragmatic uh, underpinnings. So people are are generally managing across a landscape for various purposes. And one of the products is that is, is lower fuel loads across a landscape. And we know from early uh, explorers' accounts of the landscapes in these areas that have burned uh, in the recent fires and other catastrophic fires, that the landscapes were radically different. They were much more open, often free of forest, just as scattered large individual trees, a savanna, if you like, a temperate savanna. 
So if we're going to seriously um, increase our capacity to manage our landscape in the face of increasing uh, incidents of catastrophic wildfires, we need to look to our First Nations people to help us man manage the landscape, trust them to, to um, carry out the burning that's required in a lot of landscapes to maintain low landscape fuel loads as well as other purposes. So a lot of work to be done still in Australia. Now, lastly, a question from Craig Pollard, who is a viewer on Facebook. He asks, how do continual burn-offs like hazard reduction affect our soil? Yeah, it's another good one. It depends on the intensity of the burn. If you're burning really frequently, you end up liberating soil um, from the ground. Okay, you're reducing the, the ground cover. And if you get a rain after that, you end up stripping soil away. Um, the more intense the fire is, the more, the more damage to the soil there is, the more you liberate um, soil from the ground. And that ends up in waterways and it can uh, dirty up our water res uh, reservoirs and all of these sorts of things. Um, but l frequent low intensity, okay, low intensity and frequent burning uh, has a much less impact on our soils than the hot, bigger fires that we've seen most recently. So the work that you do in the preserving or, or maintaining forests with low frequency burning can actually help once you get these big fires roll through, lessen their impact and you have better condition on your soils or a better impact on your soils. So that's, you can actually have healthy soils, healthy burning regimes. Um, it just depends on the intensity. That's a lot of interesting information and great advice today, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us and let's hope that we never see a recurrence of the bushfires that we saw over this past summer. With any luck, uh, that'll be the case. Thanks, Michelle. And don't forget, for regular video updates from the Australian Academy of Science, follow us on social media. I'm Michelle Tapper. See you soon.